Hi, I'm John Riley. I'm here for Northampton Community Television. We're going to be filming here on the Smith College campus. We've been invited into the archives, the rare books, and the Sophia Smith collection to see exactly what is hidden away here in the library. It's something that uh, usually scholars and students get to see, faculty, but the, uh, the library is looking forward to opening this up more to the public, more to people that live here in Northampton. And we're going to give you a sneak preview of some of the treasures that are here in the archive. We're going to be meeting with Elizabeth Myers, the director of the Rare Book Collection today. We'll be interviewing her in just a couple minutes. And then we're going to get to see some of the treasures here in the archives. Before we go in, I wanted to show you a picture of what Nielsen is going to look like when they're finished. They've kept the facade and the structure of the old Nielsen Library and have added on two new wings. It's been designed by Maya Lin, who designed the Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, D.C. It's going to be a real showcase here on the campus and in Northampton. One of the most interesting things, I think, for our shoot today is that when this is done, the centerpiece of this library is going to be the archives, the rare books, and the Sophia Smith collection. It'll be a real jewel case for that collection. I'm here with uh, Elizabeth Myers, who's the director of the special collections here at Smith College. She's been uh, gracious enough to allow us to come in and film uh, here in the archives. Archives have always been considered kind of a uh, locked away secret place in a library. And I think uh, you're looking to make them more available, is that so? Uh, have more hands-on, uh, uh, public students, more, more, more uh, access to, to the archives. That's true. Um, we, we're a public facility, um, even though we're housed on the Smith campus, and we do um, support te the teaching mission of the college. Um, in fact, we're very much intertwined with the, with the mission of the college, but we are a public facility and we serve researchers from uh, the Northampton community, including students um, K through 12, uh, as well as just community members who are interested, uh, you know, in various types of history. I mean, really, it's the story of Northampton becomes the story of Smith. The story of Smith is a part of the story of Northampton. These two things are linked. and. Um, we also host researchers from around the world, so from from the the new to, new to the process to those more advanced scholars. It's interesting to hear that. I, I hadn't thought of it as like a place for Northampton history, but it really is. Uh, the history of the college is is a history of Northampton as well. Yes. But I was visiting here a, a few weeks ago, and I was in your uh, reference room, and there were people from all over the world. There were French students <laughs> studying. It's, you really have to walk uh, two paths that are local and, and international at the same time, but like the college itself. Now, how is it that archives and rare books have become so important to libraries? Uh, they used to be, like I said earlier, the, the dusty, hidden away part of the library. Now they're, they're kind of the centerpiece, and they will be more the centerpiece in Nielsen, too. That's true. I think the purpose of archives, manuscripts, and rare books hasn't really changed, but the way that the institutions or the people, the institutions that hold them or the individuals who use them think about them has changed. Um, these primary sources, these original materials, they form the evidence, um, they, they stand for a truth, um, they, they're not the interpreted version as you might find with a secondary, uh, like a published history source. So, you know, the real advantage is that we have um, individuals who come in and they, they want to look for themselves. They, they're critically engaged with the documents or the books or the objects and um, they, they're able to come to their own conclusions and, and to seek a kind of truth uh, that, that um, you know, secondary materials are someone else's truth, right? They did the research, they've presented an idea, um, but the archives are the archives. Um, it's, it's the real deal. So I think in that way, um, archives have always had that function, whether it was for the state or for the church or for academic institutions um, or governments um, and increasingly companies or corporations, this idea that we have to document ourselves, we have to um, understand you know, very transactional things like the exchange of property or um, you know, the births and death records, but um, special collections 
are increasingly about the narrative of how people lived, not just you know, just the facts, right? So the diaries, the letters, the, the way in which people experienced um, their life and their challenges and their opportunities, um, all of that exists is in the archives. It's the stories, the narratives. So um, because of that, um, you know, for a long time, because, you know, we joke and we say, well, archives are special, but we're not special, special. <laughs> and part of that is because people tend to think of it, again, as the dusty, um, dark, uh, locked away, very secretive, you have to know somebody, you have to get permission. Um, and it's true, coming into a special collections and using the material isn't a, the same as a library. But, um, and that's partly because we just want to make sure those records are there for users in perpetuity, right? Or at least as long as we can envision in perpetuity. Sure. But um, archivists and librarians and curators have really, in the last 20 years, pivoted around the idea of being gatekeepers to being gateways. And, you know, if, if the goal of a special collections is just to store material, to preserve it for future generations in the abstract, you, you'd save a lot more money, certainly, in labor if you just um, put it in a well uh, maintained attic and and hoped for the best. We're all about access and use, and I think that's true across the profession. I think that's great, and that's one of the main reasons that we're here is to let people know that and uh, to let the citizens here in Northampton know that this is available to them to access. And uh, the librarians here are very helpful at helping you find the things that you may be looking for. Which is a great point. I think people sometimes also get intimidated by special collections in the sense that it's not like a, a book. You look up in a catalog and it's there. You, you know, you look up on Amazon, you get all this information about it, and you have a very clear way of using it and accessing it. Whereas you come to special collections, it's a little bit different. It can be intimidating, but I, I again, I think we're working every day to make sure that anyone of any age, of, for any purpose, can come in here and use the material. Now, I'll... Uh when you talk about archives, you're talking about the past, but you're also talking about the future because you're talking about collecting mm -hmm. what you're buying, what you're getting donated, what you're looking for. How are you looking to grow the archives? What areas are you looking to expand? Uh, you'd use the term of where are the silences. I really like that. Where are you looking to to grow the like, grow the archives and the collection? Great question, and in fact, we're undergoing a collection development review process right now, which is a healthy way of, of taking a look at where are the collection strengths and where are the weaknesses, where are the silences, who have we not captured uh, in the record, um, who have we captured enough of in terms of their voice or their story. So that's a process we're doing, and it, it takes a while. It takes some months to get through to really do it deliberately. Uh, I can tell you that historically, the, there are three collections that make up Smith College Special Collections. Okay. Um, there's the College Archives, which does exactly what you'd expect. Mm -hmm. It really documents the intellectual life, but also the life of students, administrators, uh, really the life of the campus, um, going back to and even a little before its founding. Then you have the Mortimer Rare Book Collection, which is a wonderful teaching collection that is very diverse in its subject matter because it was built to be a teaching collection. Um, we have strengths, of course, um, and we're probably most well known for having um, one of the, uh, the most comprehensive Sylvia Plath collections, mm -hmm. uh, but there are many others as well. Um, and again, it's very diverse, so we have from cuneiform tablets um, up to contemporary artist books, yeah. um, that, so really thousands of years of, of sort of human intellectual creation. Like you said, a teaching collection. Very much a teaching collection. And you do like your students to be hands-on with this stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Unless you're using photographs, then uh, we, yeah. we, we don't want you to have gloves on. Yeah. We, you know, we want you to have the tactile interaction with the material. Um, and in fact, um, recent research has shown that wearing gloves using um, materials can be damaging because you lose that ability to connect Do you with make them. people wash their hands before they touch them? We don't even do that. We okay. just we just ask you to keep the food and the, okay. and the liquids out. That's important. <laughs> very important. Very important. Some some baseline, but again, if if we're not if we're not collecting it to be used, we shouldn't really be collecting well, it. I think people are doing so much with like the antibacterial stuff that their hands are probably very clean when they come here. I hope so. <laughs> now, uh, and, and speaking of touching, uh, you have uh, concentrations in archives and book studies for your students. I'm very interested in that because not a lot of colleges do that. How That's is true. that? 
what do they do? So the, the concentrations as a whole have been at Smith, I th not not even 10 years, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I have to look into which is the, the oldest. Um, but there, so there are several across campus, and they were part of an initiative of the Pro uh, Office of the Provost. And it was really to create ways for students to not just gain the theoretical um, context, but also understand the, the real um, experiential component of working with materials. So with rare books and uh, archives and special collections, there's certainly that piece of understanding how do archives get used in research? Mm -hmm. How do you mine documents for information? How do you do interpretation of photographs? But also then, how do you actually manage an archive? How do you make choices about what you pay for and what you don't? So these students could go on to be historians or possibly even librarians. For sure. Um, a lot of opportunities there. It's very interesting to see people studying books and, and archives now. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very interested in that. Uh, Beth, you've told us about the rare books and the college archives. Uh, the third part of the equation of your collections is the Sophia Smith collections. What is that? Uh, how does that fit into your archives and your rare books? So the, the Sophia Smith collection is really the Sophia Smith collection of women's history. Uh, it is the oldest collection of women's history in the country and uh, second oldest in the world. Wow. Um, and, we are, um, and we are among one of the largest uh, collections. You know, when it was first founded, um, which is really very early in the early 1940s, along this, this, at the time, a very radical, almost activist idea that while there were archives that were collecting many men, uh, women were not seen as particularly valuable, or their records were not seen as valuable. So Smith College, being Smith College, uh, decided <laughs> to, um, to, to, to create a repository where those records could come and have a home and be safe and, and stewarded. So the early collection focused on suffering and abolition, um, you know, those uh, incredible families where, for example, in the Garrison family or the Hale family, you have many of the men are be have been collected and, and by other institutions, but the women, um, the sisters, mothers, aunts, grandmothers, they had not. And so we were able to really, again, sort of step in and, and save that history. Um, and we also, in the Sophia Smith collection, started very early collecting around women's reproduction um, and women's reproductive health and justice. So we have an incredible collection um, from before Margaret Sanger, including Margaret Sanger, through um, Planned Parenthood um, records here, and we're, we're very excited about that. But we also collect around women's reproductive health, justice, and well-being, um, women of color, uh, women from different parts of the country, um, not just the big national organizations and, and the more famous, but also those who are really doing community and, and grassroots uh, activism on behalf of women. So it's a wonderful collection, and it's one, I think, that brings people here uh, by the hundreds and hundreds every year, and it's one that we continue to seek to grow. Seems like a very unique collection, and um, how, how does that fit in, then, to the archives and the rare books? Are these three separate collections, or do they kind of all go together? How, how does that fit? So they each have their own collection, collecting scope, but they are, and we are housed together. So we're co-located, and operationally we're together. The curators and archivists who steward those collections work very closely together, doing teaching um, and outreach into the community, various communities, as well as working with donors. So um, there are there are some overlaps. We're 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 a very clear mm -hmm. Venn diagram in terms of content because you can't even the college archives is really the story of women women's education. Uh, here and it's it, it has the story of race and it has the story of, of immigration and so you know there is a lot of overlap between the three but they are distinctive um, looking down the road as we look at our collection development and we we're looking to fill those silences there are areas to grow in and I think that you know certainly for the rare book room we're, we're thinking about how do we collect out of a non-western tradition what if we are looking to uh, South America or to Asia um, for the Sophia Smith collection, there are many, still many women who are not being documented. For example, around women's prison experiences, 
um, and the shackling movement, women in disability issues, women in the internet and technology. Um, so uh, trans women, of course. So we're, we're thinking really about sort of who's out there, who's not being documented, or who can we help to document. Um, certainly there's no, no place can collect it all um, and manage it. So we're, we're really sort of not wanting to compete, but wanting to make sure that we're giving as complete of history as we can of women. I can see how that fits into your whole collection, and it really makes the whole collection even more exciting than what we've been talking about. Um, I'm going to give you a couple more uh, phrases that uh, I'm quoting you on, and I just will run these by you. Information as activism. What did you mean when you said that? It, this, this, like, there's a again. It goes back to the idea of, of archives and and rare books, manuscripts of being, having evidentiary value. And so when people are seeking a kind of, um, you know, where did I come from? They want to, they really want to put themselves in the context of the past. It's, it's not as easy, you know, you hear the phrase like we learn from the past so we don't repeat in the future. But of course we repeat things constantly. But that doesn't mean that the past doesn't have a way for us to know ourselves, to know our community, to know um, our place, to find place. And I think for, for those groups, especially at this archives, this special collection, for those groups who have been left out of the historical record for a very long time, have been underrepresented, who have been silenced, the mere act of representation, of being able to find themselves, uh, matters. It matters a great deal and that itself becomes a type of activism. The other side of that is that we work with women um, activists and um, women's organizations who are, are working in activism um, and so we are the repository for, for, for many of those women mm. and we work with them as they're going now. So if they're working on a campaign, they want to counter a political point or they're putting together um, a march or they want to, whatever it is, we can help provide them with materials that support that work. And so we're very much a living, breathing, contemporary place despite being focused on the past. And to close out our, our interview today, I wanted to ask you one last question. Uh, you used this phrase too, we're all digital archivists now, uh, kind of showing how archives are changing and how books are changing, that so much of it is online. Are you doing a lot of uh, digitizing of your, of your archives? Uh, is that a big part of what you do? Uh, it's a, it, there's sort of two ways to think about um, electronic records. One of them is that you want to digitize, you want to migrate material from its fixed form into a digital form. And the other is that increasingly people are working um, in, they're only working in digital, they're only working in mm -hmm. Google Docs, their, their social media life is uh -huh. very vibrant. That's really interesting. Um, yeah. And so how do we capture that? How do we make it accessible? Mm. Um, along Born into the digital, future? yeah. So um, yes, the answer to that question is yes, both. I mean, I think, so at its core, this is a time in, in archives, special collections, and libraries in which we're sitting at a kind of center, a, a, a nexus, a kind of coming together point um, between many different um, professions and, and groups of people who are all wrestling with what does it mean to manage cultural information in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. So that has to involve people who understand content. It has to involve also people who understand the technology. And you know, this coming together of, of, of staff, of people who are just interested in wrestling with these questions, how do you preserve an email? What does it look like? Um, what's the structure of that? How do you provide access to it? How do we think about privacy and copyright in an open web environment? Um, how do we honor and stewardship, uh, honor our donors and stewardship the records um, ethically? So it's it's a really, I think it's actually the, really just an amazing time to be in this field. And you know, I'm grateful every day for my colleagues who you know, challenge my thinking and assumptions that I make about how people exchange knowledge, build knowledge and exchange information. So. Well, it sounds like the college and the, the library have made a very good decision to make you the centerpiece of <laughs> Nielsen too. Yes, and that and that's um, special collections, not me literally. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean you as the institution. Me as the institution, yes, um, absolutely. I, in fact, it's one of the reasons I came to Smith is that I, I do believe it's on the forefront. Um, it's very much on the on the forward edge of thinking about special collections as being part of what makes uh, an educational higher ed different. What makes it special? Um, the collections here are unprecedented for um, in size, scope, um, and the staff that support it than any Oberlin group mm -hmm. 
uh, yeah. college, and you know we can we can certainly um, compare ourselves to some some of the best research one level universities because Smith has decided this is where it wants to put its time, energy, and effort and um, and support. So I am grateful for that every day. Well, it's really going to be a great addition. Um, to the library, to the college, and to the town of Northampton. We're really looking forward to seeing it. The new building. Seeing yeah, all we are together. all looking forward to all seeing it together. all coming together. Great. Well, yes. thanks a lot, Elizabeth. Sure. Thank you. Appreciate your time. So you guys are known as the stewards. That's how you were introduced to me. Uh, what does steward mean? What do you do as a steward? Yeah, I think it's a term that encompasses a lot of the things that we have in common with our job. Nancy and I are archivists, which means we work with unique and rare records, and Shannon is a curator of rare books. But for all of us at Smith College, we bring in new collections, we take care of the collections we have and think about their long-term accessibility, and we also do teaching with um, students in the Smith College and five colleges in the larger area. So it's, it's sort of a, it's a good term to think of um, sort of the, the full range of what we do um, in terms of the stewardship of the collections across time and um, caring for but making them available and bringing in new materials that are in um, conversation with what we already have as well. And I, I think that over time the, the term curator has sort of gives it this lofty sense and also the sense of this is my domain and you're not allowed particularly to be here, whereas steward is much more open and really reflects the way that archives and special collections have changed significantly over time. Now, uh, you each have a separate uh, specialty that you work in. What, what is yours, Maureen? So I work with the Sophia Smith Collection of Women's History. Um, we are a 77-year-old repository, and we're actually one of the first places on the whole world that had this idea that women as a group have contributions to make to the world and they've created documentation of those contributions and that we can learn from them. So uh, the Sophia Smith Collection started by collecting suffragists and abolitionists who had a lot of stuff in their attics and people wanted to make sure that it ended up here. Um, over time the Sophia Smith Collection has expanded to talk about the ways that women are changing the world. We're particularly strong on thinking about access to health care, particularly reproductive health, access to abortion, making sure that um, women can live the lives they want and have and contribute to the families in the way that works best for them. That sounds great. It sounds like you're really personally involved in this too, which is what I, I really like hearing that. It's yeah, really cool. absolutely. I mean, the best thing about my job is the way we get records is we talk to people. So every day I get to talk to people who are truly changing the world on behalf of women and other gender minorities, and that's such a privilege. That's really, really cool. And Shannon, what is your uh, specialty? What yeah, you so I'm the um, I'm the curator of the Mortimer Rare Book Collection. Oh, what a privilege that is. It that's is. really cool. It and is. you're fairly new. Aren't I'm you? fairly new. I've been here a year, um, and it's named after Ruth Mortimer, who is a really important um, a member of the Smith community. Um, she is a Smithy herself um, and also um, came back to work at Smith and really opened up the rare book collections to the students to make sure that they understood that this was their collection and this is something they could learn from. So it wouldn't just be something that was behind closed doors that maybe certain privileged faculty could access, but that students had access to historical and cultural materials um, in a really meaningful way. Um, so it's it's really wonderful to have her name associated with the collection. Um, it used to be known as the Mortimer Rare Book Room, so now we're the Mortimer Rare Book Collection. Um, and um, unlike uh, the Sophia Smith Collection and College Archives, the Mortimer Rare Book Collection is much more about um, being a teaching collection. So rather than being um, having the more, more depth um, in terms of women's history and activism, uh, we're more broad. So we investigate what can we contribute to um, the curriculum at Smith. Um, so working with faculty, working with students to bring in materials that can supplement and enrich the curriculum. 
curriculum is really a big part of what we're doing. We have um, a ton of uh, materials related to literature, American and um, English literature in particular, and um, lots of first editions of various texts and also texts um, over time so you can see different editions and how they change and how certain representations and um, designs can shift our perceptions and our engagement with a particular single text um, can be really interesting to investigate. Um, we're currently working on um, further diversifying our collection, bringing in more East Asian and Middle Eastern and um, Latin American materials, African American materials, um, African diasporic materials as well. So I'm really, um, I feel very excited to be here at this moment um, and um, bringing these incre this incredible collection that really is um, so phenomenal for a college. Um, I don't know of any other college in this country, I mean research university sure, but any college in this country that has such a rich collection as we have here that we can share with Smith students and other students in the five colleges as Maureen noted. So it's, it's an absolute privilege to be here and I, I learn something every day from the students, from my colleagues, um, from the materials that for me always tell a story. So I, um, I'm really glad to be here. That's great. Is there any particular area that you're interested in as far as rare books go? Yeah, um, so I like, um, I'm especially interested in the intersection between um, the history of the book and the history of science. So looking at um, how um, the natural world was sort of explored, investigated, um, documented and disseminated. So it could be um, something like going on um, a mission to um, another part of the world and documenting specific um, types of foliage or animal life um, and bringing that back and conveying that to the person who traveled would have to convey that to the writer, um, to an engraver um, and a publisher, get that out into the world and then seeing how people would share um, their books with others. So I'm also interested in um, marks of use annotations. So um, accreting knowledge onto a particular object over time. And you can often find women in various contexts there as well. They might have been printers, they might have been binders, they might have been reading these texts and sharing their thoughts. Um, so even though you might think that um, women are um, not a part of certain um, historical moments, especially as manifested in rare book collections. They're in fact there, we just have to find them in different ways. That's really interesting. Yeah. Nancy, what is your role? So I'm the college archivist, and my responsibility is to collect, what I like to say, document the life of the college. So we do that by collecting materials that relate to the administrative uh, offices, uh, various deans of faculty and student and student life. We collect faculty papers because we're trying to reflect what teaching went on at Smith since its beginning. Um, but really the most fabulous piece of the College Archives collection and the one that I like the most and gets a lot of attention is our collection of undergraduate materials. So we have letters, journals, diaries, photograph albums, scrapbooks. Before they all become famous. But before they all become <laughs> famous and mostly the unfamous ones. Um, but the letters and uh, photos are a way to understand what it was like to be an undergraduate at the time, get any given time in Smith's history. And um, I think Smith is very unique in that way. A lot of other colleges and universities will have traditional administrative materials, office materials, but the depth of our undergraduate materials is significant. Well, uh, Northampton, speaking for Northampton Community Television, we really appreciate all of you telling us about what you have, and we're going to take a look at them in a second to let the citizens and people here living in Northampton know that this exists and that they can come here and share it too. I think that's really Definitely. a hidden hidden gem that people don't know enough about. I'm really glad you brought that up. Yes, we are open to everybody. We're open to the public and we really hope that if folks have an interest, a research interest, if they want to know about women's history or rare books or the history of Smith College and how they've intersected with that, that they'll come here and that they'll use our materials in our meeting room. And one of the things that uh, Beth and I were talking about earlier is you aren't on your own if you come here looking for stuff. You're here to help them find it. You're here to help them do some of the research that they may want to do. So it's not just somebody wondering, it's like I'm lost, I don't know where everything is. They're going to get a hand. 
Um, our reading room is open to the public, as Maureen noted, and you don't need to make an appointment. You can just show up and say, you know, I'm interested in seeing a letter written by Sylvia Plath, or I'm interested in learning more about women's activism around um, Native American um, experience. So, and, and we can help you locate specific materials that could be of interest to you. So um, it's really nice to just say, you can come in. You don't need to make an appointment. You need, don't even need to know specifically what you're looking for. We can help you. Um, our reading room is open to everyone. Um, we're in a temporary location for a few years while the Nielsen Library is being renovated. Um, but our colleagues in the libraries more generally can help guide you to our reading room if it's a little confusing to find it on your own. Um, and we great. hope that everyone will come in. Thanks. Let's see what you have. Show us some of your uh, your treasures. So, you know, you asked me to pick some of my favorite objects, and that's a really hard thing to do because I think what's so powerful about archives are the ways that they interact with one another and that they tell bigger stories. So, I'm going to show you two objects that I really, really love, um, and let you know that there's a lot more where this came from. So this is a diary of Martha Coffin Wright. Martha Coffin Wright is a suffragist. She helped um, organize the Seneca Falls Women's Convention in 1848. Um, and something that I really love about this diary is that it's documentation of her friendships and her family and her networks. And so she writes every day about what she's done and who she's encountered. And here, something you can see is that her friend Harriet Tubman came and visited with her. Um, Miriam Coffin Wright's daughter is Ellen Wright Garrison, and this is her book here. It's, we're, we call it the hair book. Um, Ellen Wright Garrison was the daughter, uh, daughter-in-law of William Lloyd Garrison. William Lloyd Garrison is an abolitionist. He had a newspaper called The Liberator. He's pretty well known in abolitionist circles. And something that I really like to think about here is um, the role of women in these abolitionist movements and in the movements after abolition of freedmen's rights and thinking about the rights of Chinese immigrants, of women's roles and women's networks. And so when you first look at this book, you think, what is going on here? <laughs> because what you see is hair. And it's, it's a little bit creepy. Sometimes when I show this to students, they kind of want to go on the other side of the room. Others of them want to get really close. Wow. Um, <laughs> And so um, this comes out of this Victorian habit of collecting locks of hair. Um, something to remember is that uh, hair doesn't decompose, right? And so that it keeps a lot of um, the attributes of the living person who had it on her head. And so you would collect a lock of your friend's hair, perhaps because you didn't know the next time you would see them. Um, traveling to visit other folks took a long time. This is from the records of the Third World Women's Alliance. And the Third World Women's Alliance formed in Oakland, California. A lot of folks who came out of the civil rights movement, this was um, a black-led women's movement, and they were in reaction to both the patriarchy of the civil rights movement and the racism of the mainstream women's liberation movement. And I really love this collection because this is a collection of folks who were all volunteers and who self-documented themselves so, so much. So you can see in the larger collection um, minutes of meetings, extensive documentation of what they were up to. They had self-education committees because there was this idea of there can be no movement unless you really know your history. So there would be committees of folks who learned the history of um, African-American women, of women in other parts of the world. And these are documents of a campaign that they had done called the Coalition Against Infant Mortality. And this was sort of based on an understanding of a particular hospital in Oakland, California was showing that the infant mortality rates for the babies of black women were much, much higher than the infant mortality rates of other women. And this was, you can see here, in black and white, what the campaign looked like to say, how are we going to get organized? Who are our partners going to be? How are we going to talk to the press? How are we going to think about this? And so you see document after document after document of planning and thinking through and figuring out, you know, they even, I think they call it, um, propaganda subcommittee. Like, how are we going to give our message forward in a way that people what are going to really understand? This, so this particular document is from January 1978, and that was pretty much sort of the heart of when this group was active. Um, so I really love documentation of activist organizations like this. We have a lot of it. And something that I find that it's really useful for is many people in their lives want to be active about some sort of a cause. And this is such a great opportunity to learn from the experts. How right? did you come to have this here? Yeah, this came to the repository, I think, about 20 years ago. This was based on relationships that we've built on 
with activists throughout the United States so that folks know that this is a place where you can put your history really safe, yeah. and it'll be tr Take yes care, yeah. trustworthy that's exactly right and that will make this history known and that it's valuable to us it's very interesting thank you sure thing all right so um, I when you asked for us to select our favorite item um, I have to say that my favorite item is always what's in front of me at a given moment because each object tells its own story. Um, and to sort of pull one story out from the context that we have is quite a challenge. Um, but I do have a favorite printed book um, and uh, I couldn't uh, take this opportunity not to share it with you. So, um, so this is a copy of Micrographia from 1665. It was written by Robert Hooke, um, who was the first curator of experiments for the Royal Society in London. And um, it's a book about um, what you can do with a microscope. Um, and this was a new technology at this period. And Robert Hooke was interested in sharing, it, it's almost like it's, a, um, it's an advertisement for what you can do with technology, what you can do with a microscope, what you can learn. Um, unlike many of his colleagues in the Royal Society, he was not a wealthy man. And so he didn't go on all those journeys around the world um, learning about um, the natural history um, ac across the world, he was looking at um, what was going on in London itself. So that means that the things he were looking at, he was looking at, were more the minutia of life. And um, But what he did with it was he, he showed how beautiful it is. And um, he was a man who was both um, what we consider now a scientist, what they would consider a natural philosopher, um, but also um, a man of God. And so his interest was in showing how beautiful God's work could be. Um, so if you're in London, 1665, one of the tiny creatures around you that you're going to be very used to constantly bugging you um, is a flea. Um, so he takes this really obnoxious, horrifying creature that everyone hates, and he um, looks at it under the microscope, and he draws it with as much detail as possible, and then provides that drawing to um, an engraver, and he oversaw that engraving, so he was making sure it was as accurate as possible. He was really interested in accuracy. Um, and then he uh, included it in this book that he also wrote. Um, so each section, there is a little bit on the, the, the creature or object that he's investigating, and then there are these beautiful fold-out plates. Some of the plates are not fold-out like this one, um, but one of the things I love about the fold-out plates, this one of the flea, and then I'll also show you the one of the louse is that we're seeing these very these creatures that people were really unhappy about um, here's a louse grasping um, a, a strand of hair so that connects to um, the hair book you saw earlier perhaps <laughs> um, but it um, it's it's at the scale of an elephant or a lion, and it's a louse, and it's a flea. Um, so thinking about how he's elevating these really, these really, these creatures that people just found just infuriatingly annoying, but they're really beautiful to him, um, and um, because they're creatures of God. Um, one of the things he does at the beginning here is he shows you, shows us. Um, what man-made objects look like um, in counterposition to what what God's creatures look like. So you get um, the point of a pencil, you get a full stop, a period, a printed period, and a razor's edge. And you go deeper and deeper and you look closer and closer and it becomes uglier and uglier, misshapen. Um, and um, you can see the you know, a period, um, printed period usually looks quite round and, and perfectly um, inked, but this looks like a, a, a great splotch of London dirt, he called it. So um, he's really exploring um, all of these things around him um, in this very detailed way. Um, one of the things that we have to thank him for is the use of the word cell. Um, when he was, in, he was investigating cork, a piece of cork. He took a look at it under the microscope and thought it looked like a monastic um, uh, living space. And so he said, oh, look at these cells. And that's how we got the term cell. So um, here's our, our cork cells right here. 
was he the first person to be using a microscope? Or he was he not. Kind of he was not the first person to use a microscope. Um, there were multiple people using them at the same time, but he was one of the first people to really write about it and show what you could do with it. Um, he, at the same time, there were other um, microscopists that were at work, and um, they were sort of comparing notes and sharing um, drawings and letters across Europe. Um, uh, Van Leeuwenhoek, um, Malpighi, so various um, people in various parts of Europe, they were sharing information, um, but there was certainly some competition as well. Um, one thing I want to show you, as, as a book person, I really dislike um, seeing mold in books. However, here is a picture of book mold um, that I'm okay with seeing um, because it's an image, um, but it actually looks like a beautiful sort of almost Seussian forest um, and it is just, you know, some, some mold that you might find on a book. So um, he's really investigating in a really deep and dense way. So um, he must I have sold a lot of microscopes. <laughs> and and you know the funny thing is he wasn't a you know a manufacturer of microscopes. Um, he really just wanted people to learn and investigate into the natural world using the technology available to them at the time. So um, so that's why this is one of my favorite objects. Um, I'm also going to just very quickly show you another book that I think is great. Um, so I am really interested in, um, in books that are um, interactive, that give you a chance to use them and work with them. And this book is called the Cosmographia. And this is actually a Spanish edition. And it is from, let's see, 1548. And um, one of the things that I can show you in here that I just absolutely love are these, um, are these basically paper machines called volvels. So um, you can use them to, ca to do some calculations, and they were often done for astronomical calculations. So the printer would print. Um, the initial circle and then print some additional pages with the different pieces and then um, later the, the binder or the, um, the purchaser of the book would actually cut out those pieces and attach it themselves. So, um, so you get different things that they use to actually make the attachment. In this case it's thread, it can be various other things like a pin um, and then you can actually move the, the machine around. So it's a machine um, a calculating machine um, from 1548. Um, and there are a lot of books that do have volvels, and they're so much fun and interesting because you actually get to use them um, and you get to make new knowledge as you're moving them around and calculating something. So it's something that um, is interactive, but also something that helps you um, learn more about the world around you. Um, they also created on the, pa on the page, um, on the reverse side, a space so that you could attach um, the volvel pieces on this side and then have underneath that the little bit of string and then put this attachment on top of it so that you're not covering up any of the text. So they left that space open specifically for that to be there. So they were planning ahead um, and making sure that there was enough space for their machines to function. Um, yeah, it's really... It looks like it's new. It does. And yeah, and part of that is because the paper that we used in this period is made of linen rags. So it was actually the quality um, of the linen rag converted into this paper is really high. And then in the middle of the 19th century, we switched to wood pulp. And then, so you see 19th century, 20th century books that are in much worse condition um, because of the quality of the materials that were used. So this book is in great condition and all of its colleagues are also in great condition because they're just high quality paper and we've been able to keep them in really good conditions at Smith College. We have climate control, so we maintain a certain temperature and humidity um, and that helps us um, keep them in good condition and also we you know turn off the lights when we're not in an area where we're um, we're uh, paging something so we really make sure that everything is well cared for it's just a beautiful book beautiful binding. yes yeah. it's fun yes so this is a, um, a vellum binding so it's parchment animal skin this one is um, a more recent um, 
rebinding um, in leather that is emulating what it might have originally looked like, but it is a more contemporary version. Thanks so much for sharing yeah. all this with us. Yeah, it's thank, really you. Stuff. thank you. So I have to third the comment of both Shannon and Maureen that when we as stewards are asked to bring out something really cool, we immediately stop because almost everything that we have we think is cool. That's why we're in, one of the reasons why we're in the jobs we are in. Um, but in the College Archives collection, uh, this fan by a student named Ethel Fifield, class of 1895, is um, really unique uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, primarily because it contains photographic images that she we're assuming she or her friends took of themselves, of faculty members, um, and she placed, she cut them out. Uh, these happen to be cyanotypes, so the printed image is printed on uh, what is more commonly known as blueprint paper. And so that's why it has the wonderful blue hue that it does. Um, she decided, you know, selected her, her images. She was curating her photographic collection and she placed them on a fan which she then also uh, created all sorts of little um, leaves around and more than likely this image was placed on uh, her room, one of her room's walls. Uh, what we see in the college archives with photographs of student rooms is that they contain uh, a fantastic amount of photographs. You know, today everyone will pull out their phone and they'll take a look at uh, their, you know, they'll flip, scroll through their photos on their iPhone or their Android. In 1890s and in early 1900s, they, the students were plastering paper prints on their walls. And uh, I wish if I had thought it through, I would have brought in an image like that to show you, to see how it was done. Um, but this is this is a fantastic um, Do you piece. know who these people are? Right? Uh, I know some of them. These are faculty members. Oh, okay. These are um, top, and then the the uh, more informal um, images of, of students are, I'm, I'm assuming they are her friends. The sad fact is that we don't have an identified image of Ethel, so I can't say to you, oh, and here is the creator uh, of this wonderful fan. But what we do have in the class of 1895 records are uh, group photographs of the women. And I don't know if this. Yep, that's probably, thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. So this right. happens to be the class of 1895 in their first year. So for the mathematicians in the group, that is 1880, 90. Not 1895 would be 1891. 1891. My colleagues are the mathematicians. Um, so they are, they are actually sitting in front of, uh, this looks to be Hubbard House, which is still a student residence on campus. And just like today, when the first year students come in, they get their class photograph taken. That's what this is, just a hundred plus years later. So the College Archives has a wonderful collection of uh, group photos as well as the individual uh, products that students can create. Um, and what's really great about the photographic piece of the College Archives, particularly in this time period, this is the, the early phase of uh, Kodak introducing the handheld camera. And when they created the first uh, Brownie series of cameras, they were really targeting it and marketing it towards women because it was light, it had film already in it, and basically what you did, and as they said, is you snap the image, take 100 pictures, and then send it off, and they do the processing for you return the prints as well as return a camera with film already in it for the next hundred images. And so Smith students were actively uh, documenting every type of activity that they were engaging in throughout uh, their time here. And also they, they took images where uh, professional photographers couldn't go. They took them in their houses, in their student residences. Um, they took them on their travels as uh, students on Mountain Day to Hadley, to Amherst, to 
Mount Skinner to Waitley Glen, all over the place. And so simply by taking a look at the photographs that we have that are vernacular or self-made by the students, you can really get a good sense of what was going on in their That's lives. Some great postcards in your reference room yes. over there that yeah. are just the best. They really capture what it was like yeah. to be so, uh, in Smith so College. It, it, it's, in conjunction with all of the paper materials that we have in the archives, the uh, photographic images just really uh, can, can um, create a stronger story. And then these are also pieces that everything is connected in the college archives.